Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second day of the Dynamic Graphs Workshop. Um, we have four, plocks, four talks planned for today. And the first talk will be by Sohel, uh, and it will be on recent progress on sublinear time algorithms for maximum matching. And Sohel is an assistant professor at, of computer science at Northeastern University with a broad interest in theater computer science. He received his PhD from the University of Maryland, where he was advised by Mohamed Tagi Hajagi. Before joining Northeastern, he was a Manwani postdoc at Stanford, hosted by Moses Charikar, Aviad Rubinstein, Amin Severi, and Liang Tan. And most of his, mo much of his research revolves around sublinear time algorithms, parallel algorithms, streaming algorithms, dynamic algorithms, and graph specification. Thanks, um, Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, good morning. Um, I'll be talking about a recent progress on sublinear time algorithms for maximum matching. Um, I'll, I'll be giving two talks. Um, one talk today will be specifically focused on upper bounds on algorithms. Um, and the talk on Friday will be mostly focused on lower bounds. Um, but this is a, a workshop on dynamic algorithms. So I'll actually discuss uh, and motivate sublinear time algorithms for maximum matching um, via dynamic algorithms. Um, a good portion of this talk will actually be about this connection. Um, so I start by defining matchings. Um, so what is a matching? A matching is a set of uh, vertex disjoint edges. The red edge is your former matching. And a maximum matching is a matching of largest possible size. Um, so the maximum matching problem has numerous applications. Um, I won't be going through all of these applications, but basically it has many applications in kidney exchange, image recognition, um, online advertisement, labor markets, and resource allocation in general. Um, okay, so the maximum matching problem um, has been studied um, for nearly, um, um, from a combinatorial perspective, it's been studied for more than a century, but uh, algorithmically it's been um, uh, mostly studied since the work of Edmonds from um, 1960s, uh, who first showed that the maximum matching problem can be solved in polynomial time. He gave an M times N squared uh, time algorithm um, where, um, uh, we will use n throughout the talk to denote the number of vertices and m to denote the number of edges in the graph. Um, so there's been a lot of um, subsequent works. Um, here is what we know. Um, so this is basically the state of the art for general graphs, an algorithm of Michali and Vazirani uh, from 19, 
uh, Aedes uh, obtains an m times root n time algorithm, uh, which remains a state of the art for general graphs. Uh, for bipartite graphs, uh, finally, after a long line of work, uh, last year we got a, um, a near, almost linear time algorithm by Chen et al. Uh, for uh, the case where the graph is bipartite. Um, and also I want to point out that if you relax maximum matching to a 1 minus epsilon approximate matching, which is a matching that's at least a 1 minus epsilon as large, times as large as the maximum matching, then there's a simple algorithm by Hopkoff and Carr from 70s that obtains uh, this matching in linear time, in m over epsilon time. That's, that's not for non-bipartite. It, it works for non bipartite as well. If, if you want uh, approximation, it works for non bipartite graphs as well. I thought it's 200 and pity, but. Uh, yeah. Hopper's looks for uh, short amending paths where identity type stuff, right? So it'll be Chen just for bipartite graphs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, so, so anyway, so, so the, the point is that uh, if we relax it to. Uh, one minus epsilon approximations, we have um, simple linear time algorithms. Yeah, so this, the, yeah, hop graph graph, I thought it's the second phase that only requires um, the graph to be bipartite, but um, yeah, so um, thanks. Um, okay, so what we'll focus on today is can we actually design algorithms uh, that can go below linear time in the number of edges of the graph, um, algorithms that take um, less than n squared time if the graph is dense, um, or um, basically just, just a running time that's, uh, that, that, that cannot be as large as n squared. Um, so this is the question that we'll focus on today. Um, and as I said, this is strongly motivated by dynamic graph algorithms. Um, so um, today I'll first talk about the, the general model of sublinear time uh, graph algorithms, and then I'll talk about uh, the connection to dynamic algorithms and then tell you more about sublinear algorithms. So maximum matching, what we know, what we do not. Okay, um, so let's start with the model. So whenever you talk about um, sublinear time algorithms, um, it's important to specify how the input is represented. So there are um, two types of representations that are commonly studied for graph algorithms. Um, one is the adjacency list model, uh, and one is the adjacency matrix model. So in the first one, um, you have the list of the neighbors of each vertex. You can query um, any entry of these arrays. Um, and in the adjacency matrix model, you have an n by n matrix and uh, a Boolean matrix, and you can also query entries of this matrix. Um, and um, yeah, so here the, the response would be the ID of the neighbor. Here the response is whether the two queried vertices are adjacent or not. Um, so for the, for the adjacency list model, the trivial algorithm is to query everything. Um, the sum of length of these arrays is sum of the degrees, which is upper bounded by the number of, uh, as I'm talking about upper bounded by the number of edges of the graph. So this is order M queries. For the adjacency matrix model, it's, it's N squared queries. Um, so this is the trivial algorithm. You learn the whole graph, and then you can run your um, uh, bound minus epsilon linear uh, uh, algorithm and obtain a bound minus epsilon approximation. Um, and Immediately, the bad news is that these trivial algorithms um, are actually um, the best we can hope for if the goal is to find a constant approximation. If, if we want to find the edge set of any constant approximate matching, even if the matching is, say, 100 times smaller than the maximum matching, uh, you still have to pay uh, this, this, these many queries. Um, so in a sense, the, the right question uh, for the sublinear time uh, maximum matching problem is to instead of finding the edges of the matching, uh, just estimate the size of the output, the size of the maximum matching, right? So, so we are given a graph. We can access it either via adjacency list queries or via adjacency matrix queries. Um, and we want to query less than all of these um, entries and provide an estimation on the size of the maximum matching. Okay, so this is the problem. Any questions? If the adjacency lists are sorted, does it make a difference? That's a good question. Um, yeah, so so I'll, I'll, I'll provide an example that, that if it's not sorted, that's a problem. Um, and then uh, if it is sorted, um, so maybe let me let me actually talk about the, the, the example. Um, so before this, there, there was another question. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, no. So this is if you want to discover a constant fraction of the edges of the matching. Ah, okay. So are you given the number of edges in a incident to each node, the degree? That's and, a, and can you therefore randomly sample with, uniformly from the edges? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so in this talk, I'll be ignoring all polylog factors. Um, and if, if you ignore all polylog right, factors, you, you can just binary it. search. Yeah. So you get to the end and it says, I'm yeah. at the end. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's see some trivial lower bounds. So basically, consider this instance. The graph is either completely empty or has just one edge. Um, and suppose that we have adjacency list access to the graph. So in the first case, the matching has size 0. In the second case, it has size 1. And any multiplicative approximation would have to be able to distinguish the two cases. And for this, we're, we're going to have to make omega n queries to the adjacency of lists to find the vertex um, that has the edge, if any. Okay, So this is a simple lower bound showing that omega n time is needed. Um, yeah, a question was asked, what happens if uh, the, the lists are, the, the, the adjacency of lists are sorted um, um, or, or if the verses were, were sorted based on degrees, or, or if the adjacent lists were sorted. I asked about the edges, but they, they also asked about the vertices. Yeah, so, um, so generally, my intuition is that degree is not really a, that useful for just uh, for solving matchings. Um, and yeah, I, I have to think a little bit more about this to see if, if it would make a difference. But, but basically, that, that's um, the second example. Um, shows why degrees um, are not that useful. Um, so this is a lower bound um, by Parnas and Ron from 2007. Um, so actually going back, um, in this example, this is not really a nice lower bound in the sense that the matching is just so small. And in many cases, and we will see one, we can basically just assume that the matching is large enough, right? So it's, it's maybe linear in the number of vertices. And this lower bound is really just uh, for the case when the matching is so small that you have to just find one vertex. Uh, but basically, um, the same lower bound of omega n can be extended to the case uh, even if we assume that the matching is omega n. And this is the lower bound uh, construction. So basically, I'm just I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But basically, we have epsilon n vertices that are adjacent to every other vertex in the graph. And either you have a matching among the rest of the vertices, or you have nothing among the rest of the vertices. And to find the, so, so if you want to say, if you want to find if this vertex has an edge or not adjacent to another vertex of the core, not these dummy epsilon and vertices, you're going to have to go over all of its edges to find one. Um, so this is intuitively why omega n is needed. Um, although here the degrees of these vertices are different, so you can immediately say which instance your graph is from. Um, but that, that's easy to fix. You can just add, a, add two stars like this, and that makes all the degrees the same, except for one, for two vertices that have large degrees here and small degrees here. Um, but even finding these two vertices would be hard. So I think this is, uh, yeah, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. this. I just wanted to say that omega n is needed, even if the matching is large, um, and you have adjacency of this axis to the graph. Um, yeah, and, and here, yeah, so, so as you see, like all the verses here have the same degrees except these two vertices. It's kind of that um, still the, the size of the matchings of these two graphs are very different. Um, okay. Cool. Any questions so far? Um, so this linear in N lower bound was all we knew um, up until very recently. So this year, uh, with Mohammed sitting there and, and Aviat, um, we were able to show that if the goal is to obtain a sufficiently large approximation of maximum matching, namely a slightly better than two thirds approximation, uh, then you're going to have to spend super linear in the number of vertices time. Uh, specifically, we showed that you're going to have to spend n to the 1.2 time at least if you want to provide an, an estimation of the size of the maximum matching. That um, gives a better than two-thirds approximation. Um, yeah, so, so, so I just wanted to give a glimpse of what uh, lower bounds are known. Um, there's another lower bound also for bound exception approximations. Um, 
uh, in low degree graphs, but I did not talk about those. Yeah. Time Q using probes? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm missing something super obvious. Like, why is this stronger than the previous lower bound? Oh, the previous lower bound was omega n. So you're going to need to spend linear in the number of nodes time. Yeah, and then the other one is... And it, this work, works for any constant approximation. And the other one has, a, has, an, has the assumption that you want a good enough approximation, but the lower bound on the number of probes is, is much larger. You're going to need to spend much more time, n to 1.2 time. Instead of n. Oh, it's n to... Okay, sorry. I, I, thought, I misread. I thought it's... Yeah, it's not n half. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's not a square root n. Okay. Um, Okay. Are these examples by bipartite? Yes. Yeah, this is this is a biparagraph. Um, I mean, yeah, this is not biparagraph. You can't make it biparagraph. And is there, is it obviously harder in the, uh, what, what was it, the adjacency matrix case? Yeah, that's a good question. So this lower bound only holds in the adjacency of this model. I mean, what, what's written on, is, only, is only written for the adjacency of this model. We believe we can also get it um, for the adjacency matrix, but it's not written yet. But is there one which is obviously harder than the other? Um, no. Yeah, my intuition was that adjacency matrix is harder from the perspective of designing algorithms, but when proving lower bounds, adjacency lists are easier to, so it's a little bit. Uh, okay, so yeah. there's no reduction yeah. from one to the other. Okay, all right. Okay, so now, um, yeah, and, and I'll talk much more about this construction on Friday. So if you like lower bounds um, uh, and you're around, um, yeah. So I'll talk more about this on Friday. Okay. Um, and what do we know? Um, so I'm just going to summarize um, the state of the art. So there are, there are extensive works on sublinear algorithms for matchings. I'll talk about them just to give you uh, a sense of what is possible. Uh, this, is, this is what we know, is that you can obtain a half approximation in linear in n time, n poly log n time. Um, so, in, so going back to this lower bound, it says that this lower bound can be matched up to poly log factors if you want half approximation. In other words, the assumption that we want better than two thirds, so, so some assumption on the approximation issue is needed if you want a super linear lower bound. Okay. So, yeah, so we have basically right now the, the set of the art is three algorithms. One is half approximation in linear in n time. You can do a slightly better than half approximation in near linear. It's, yeah, this is not near linear, but it's n to one plus epsilon for any small epsilon. This, this epsilon prime and epsilon are related. So you can make this as small as you want. It will affect how much better than half you'll be. Um, and there is a recent um, one minus epsilon approximation in sub quadratic time by Cheyenne, Peter, and Tasha Paul. Okay, so this is what we know. Um, but right now, I actually want to switch to dynamic algorithms and first motivate the study of sublinear algorithms via dynamic algorithms. So I start by defining the dynamic matching problem. So what is the dynamic matching problem? So we have a graph um, that is subject to edge insertions and deletions. And at any time, we want to maintain either the edge set or the size um, of the maximum matching approximately, okay? Um, so ideally, we want to maintain the edge set of the matching. Um, um, if we have that, we also have the size, but as we will see, maintaining the size might be easier in some cases. Okay, so suppose that this is a graph now. Um, this, is, this is gonna be the maximum matching of the graph, um, maybe, this edge is inserted. Um, this doesn't really increase the size of the matching, so maybe we can leave it as is. And then maybe like if this edge is deleted, now it becomes important to include maybe um, another edge or maybe not. Yeah, I think maybe we can match this. Yeah, I think it doesn't change. Anyway, yeah, so you get the idea. So the main parameters to optimize for dynamic matching um, are the approximation ratio, how large is the matching that you maintain compared to the optimal solution. And the second one is how much time do you spend per update? Okay, so, so an edge is inserted or deleted, how much time, this is time complexity, how much time do you need to address that update? And in return, what is the approximation ratio of the algorithm? 
So these are two main parameters, but there are also a lot of other pa important parameters to optimize. Um, for example, whether the uh, bound on the update time is worst case or amortized, whether the algorithm is deterministic or randomized, whether the adversary is oblivious or adaptive if the algorithm is randomized. Um, so there are other talks today. I know David will be talking about this. Um, um, in the interest of time, I'll just hide uh, these um, uh, aspects of the algorithms that I'll talk about. I'll only focus on approximation and update time in this talk. Um, and there are a lot of works on dynamic matching, so I won't be able to really just um, tell you about everything that's known. But I'll try to just um, give you uh, an overview of the, of, of the bounds that are known. Um, so more than a decade ago, um, Baswan et al. showed that uh, you can maintain a, half a, a, a maximal matching and a half approximation of maximal matching in log n update time. Um, a few years later, Bernstein and Stein show that you can maintain a two-thirds approximation in root n time. So you spend a little bit more time per update, but in return, you maintain a much better approximation. And Gupta and Peng also show that you can spend um, n time, or more specifically, root m time, root the number of edges in the graph, and uh, maintain a bond minus epsilon approximate matching. Um, so this was what we knew up until around 2015, 16. And since then, there have been a lot of um, new trade-offs between these. So there were a lot of works um, achieving, for example, a slightly worse approximation than 2 thirds, but uh, with a faster update time of n to the 1 third, or maybe like a um, yeah, slightly better than half approximation in n to the epsilon time. So there were a lot of um, incomparable algorithms depending on the uh, update time and the approximation ratio. Are these all for general graphs? All, these are all for general graphs. Um, yeah, all of them are known for general graphs. Yeah. Um, there was one, ex so, so basically like none of these algorithms really improved the others. There was just one instance. So this year we showed with Seper, Sanjeev, and Juan that you can slightly improve over n and obtain n over some log star n factor and still obtain a one minus epsilon approximation using uh, regularity lemma. Uh, but other than this, basically, this was all we knew. Um, no improvements over these bounds. Uh, but what happened since last year uh, was that we, uh, we got a, a basically an abundance of new results for dynamic matching. Um, and all of them use sublinear algorithms. So this is started with this um, uh, work um, that I had uh, and independently, uh, Shayan, Peter, uh, Tashapol, and David had, uh, where we show that you can beat half approximation and spend only polylog time. Uh, the algorithm uses sublinear algorithms, crucially. And also, there's one catch that these blue bounds would only work for size, whereas the previous bounds will, only, will also maintain the edge set of the matching. Okay. Um, so this continued um, um, earlier this year. Um, uh, Shayan Peter and uh, Tashapol also showed that the um, one minus epsilon approximation can be maintained in um, now uh, polynomially sublinear in n time, n to the one minus epsilon time. Um, and um, recently, we showed we, we improved this slightly better than half approximation to find 58 uh, for general graphs with Amir and, and Muhammad. Okay, so so this is what we know um, about dynamic matching. Uh, to summarize, we had a bunch of algorithms maintaining the matching, the the edge set of the matching, and there was a a series of works improving over these if the goal is to maintain the size of the matching instead of the edge set, and all of them use sublinear algorithms. What about conditional lower bounds for any? Yeah, that's a good question. So the only conditional lower bound that I know for matching is for exact maximal matching. There's uh, nothing? There is no conditional lower bound um, if you want to approximate matching. Even conditional lower bounds. Yeah, so. Is, uh, give anything so, so I guess, um, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think polylog update time while my subsonic approximation is still potentially possible. I mean, it's not ruled out. Okay. 
Other questions? So the lower bound is covered N for, uh, for yeah, but for exact, only for exact matching, fully yeah, dynamic. So for one perception, one perception, one perception. Nothing. Nothing. Uh, and it's based on OMB conjecture. So based on multi-phase and nothing. Does the lower bound show any like if you specifically want to get rid of all the short of everything that happens? Yes. There's a lower bound for that, but that's just Okay. All right. Um, yeah, as I said, these blue bounds are all um, for the size version, and also they all use sublinear time algorithms, crucially. Okay. So, so I'll tell you why sublinear time algorithms are useful for uh, designing dynamic algorithms. So there's a simple reduction, um, and there's a slightly more complicated one. So I'll start with a simple reduction. So first of all, I'm going to assume throughout the talk that the size of the maximum matching at all times is going to be linear in the number of vertices. This assumption comes with a loss of generality. I won't tell you how, but it comes with a loss of generality, um, paying just polylog factors in the update time. Um, so once you have this, you can maintain the matching with the lazy approach, maintain the size of the matching with the lazy approach. So the way it works is that you approximate the size of the matching. And then you do nothing for epsilon n steps. Because the size of the matching is linear in n, with epsilon n steps, maybe you remove epsilon n edges of the matching, but the size of the matching remains unchanged. Approximately, of the bound minus epsilon factors. Um, so then you repeat this, right? So every epsilon n updates, you just estimate the size of the matching and then do absolutely nothing for the next epsilon n updates. Maybe you just change the graph to keep track of the updates. Um, OK. So what is the implication of this? The implication is that if we have a t time algorithm that alpha approximates the size of the maximum matching, then we get a dynamic algorithm maintaining almost the same approximation in t over n time. Why? Because we are amortizing the, this t time over epsilon n updates. And you can also deamortize it if you care about deamortization or getting for CS bounds. Um, yeah, but but. But basically, the, the, the idea is that you can shave off an n factor from the running time of any algorithm, any static algorithm, and get a dynamic algorithm. Um, so what, is, what does this imply? So basically, first of all, I want to mention that if, if this algorithm t um, is not sublinear, if you're going to spend n squared time if the graph is dense, then even if you amortize it over n updates, you're going to still have to pay um, an update time for, 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 for an average update. So the update time would not be better than n, and all of the previous work really just want to get uh, much better than n. Um, so this motivates really the use of sublinear algorithms for this, uh, for this algorithm t. Um, so the, for example, the, the known bounds that I mentioned, um, if you replace the half approximate n time algorithm from 2021, you'll get a Half approx almost half approximation of the size of maximum matching in polylog time. If you take the slightly better than half approximation in n to 1 plus epsilon time, you'll get an n to epsilon update time algorithm maintaining slightly better than half. These two bounds are actually not new. We knew how to do this even for maintaining the edges of the matching. This third result is new. Uh, this is um, what Bacharya et al. showed earlier this year that um, you can do a 1 minus epsilon approximation in sub quadratic time. Plugging this into this framework basically gives the 1 minus epsilon approximation in now sub linear in that time, polynomial sub linear in that time. So this is an easy reduction. Any questions? Yeah. yeah, just a stupid question. Is it t over epsilon n? Yeah, I'm hiding epsilon dependencies. Okay, okay. Are all your uh, results amortized? Uh, no, all of these can be deamortized. Yeah, there is a funny trick. We can spread the computation. Yeah. Okay. OK, so now this is a slightly more complicated reduction. So what is a slightly more complicated reduction? So the key intuition behind this is the traditional sublinear algorithms, when they're called, they know nothing about the graph. And they have to learn about the graph through queries. Okay. So the algorithm interacts with the input through queries, and that's all the algorithm knows. Um, for example, queries this, this entry, 
notices that there is an edge here uh, and uses that somehow to estimate the size of matching, for example. But this is not the case in, dy in, in the application for dynamic graphs, right? So what we can do, for example, is maybe we can maintain explicitly um, a maximal matching, which I told you is, is cheap to maintain, as right? so we can do this in polylog update time already. Um, so what happens now is that when you want to estimate the size of the maximal matching, in addition to learning about the graph through these queries, you also have some information about the graph free, for free. Okay? So this is sort of a sublinear algorithms padded with some extra information. Okay. All right. So yeah, so in fact, this is exactly what we do for the for beating half approximations in polylog time. We maintain the maximal matching. Um, so just to um, tell you how it works, basically, um, I'm, I'm going to assume uh, for this outline that the graph is bipartite. Right? Um, so here is, here is a simple static algorithm for beating half approximation for maximal matching. So the algorithm is due to Conrad, Magnus, and Matthew from 2012. Um, uh, they they was in the study of streaming algorithms, but it doesn't matter that it works for in the streaming setting. All we want is that there is a two-step, simple two-step algorithm for beating half approximate matching. So how does it work? So this graph has a perfect matching. The green edges form a perfect matching. Every vertex is matched. So what the Conrad et al. algorithm does is that it first finds a maximal matching. But this maximal matching may be small, maybe only half the size of a maximal matching in case, for example, it picks these edges. Only half of the vertices are matched. But then um, it's well known that if the matching is only half the size of the optimal, if, the max if a maximal matching is only half the size of, a, of the optimal solution, then nearly all edges should be in length three augmenting paths. Um, so in the second step, the algorithm tries to find augment short length three augmenting paths. Um, so um, what it does is it first samples um, each one of these edges of the first matching with probability roughly 0.4 um, and marks both of their endpoints and then finds another greedy matching from the marked nodes to the unmatched vertices. So this would be the second match. Okay. So that's all that the algorithm does. First, we find a maximal matching, sample some of the edges, and then match their endpoints to the unmatched vertices. Um, so, and, and it turns out that if you just return this value, which is just a function of the size of the two matchings, this is a 0.58 approximation of the size of the maximum matching, provided that the graph is by part. Is okay. 0.58 the best you can do with this method, or you can Yeah, the 0.58 is the is the best you can do with this method. Um, yeah, you have to be a little bit more formal with what this method is, but for a large fraction of algorithms, including this one, um, this is the best you can do. Um, okay. Um, all right. So now let's try to see how we can use this in the dynamic setting. So the the problem, the challenge with maintaining this is that the vertex set of the second matching is adaptively defined based on the vertex set of the first matching. Um, so from the perspective of a dynamic algorithm, um, what this means is that updates um, to the first matching M lead to vertex insertions and deletions to the graph of the second matching. Okay. And vertex insertions and deletions are, are, um, are much harder to handle. All of the algorithms that I mentioned are for edge insertions and deletions. Um, so let's, let's just um, go over this. So for example, this is the first matching. The blue matching is the second matching that we want to find between the set of the matched vertices to the unmatched vertices, sampled matched vertices to the unmatched vertices. And now suppose that this edge is deleted. And we maintaining a maximal matching, maybe like match this endpoint to this other vertex. Um, now what this happens is that we have to change, we have to kick this vertex out of the set of marked vertices and include this one instead. Um, and this would be a vertex insertion in the second graph. A vertex insertion is a hard. Um, okay. So, so yeah, so this is the challenge with maintaining both matchings. Um, but to get around this, you can use um, sublinear algorithms. The way we can use sublinear algorithms as, as follows. First of all, we maintain the matching M, the first matching, explicitly. 
using the existing polylogarithmic time or constant time algorithms for maximal matching. Um, the size, then, um, instead of finding the second matching m prime, which would require um, n squared time, if, we want, if, if in one shot we just want to compute this matching, it would require n squared time. As I told you, finding the edge set of any constant approximate matching requires linear in the number of edges time. Um, but instead of that, suppose that we just estimate its size. And for that, we can already use the greedy uh, half approximate algorithm, um, which can do this in on, on the order n time. OK, so what, what do we get? So this is for free, right? So this, I mean, for free, I mean that like you spend only polylogarithmic type per, per update. Uh, so this you have for free. The <laughs> second one takes order n time. Whenever it's called, whenever you want to compute this up, this um, estimate on the size of the matching, this takes only n time. Um, so overall, we have an algorithm that with an overhead of polylogarithmic update time, every time that you call it provides a slightly better than half approximation, 0.58 approximation in order n time. Now you plug this into the lazy approach. You um, amortize this n cost. You just call this once. Do nothing for epsilon n updates. Amortize this cost. But what you'll get is a polylogarithmic time algorithm maintaining a 0.58 approximation if, it, if the graph is bipartite. So this was, this was the whole um, algorithm for beating half approximations. Um, and the key, um, in my opinion, was the use of the sublinear algorithm, um, which now I'll, I'll talk more about. Any questions about the dynamic connection? Is, is there any worry about like the sort of adaptive adversary nature of the, like when you do the sampling? That's a great question. Um, yes, there are in fact um, a lot of technicalities that I'm hiding. I believe David will talk about um, some of the important ingredients for getting this to work against adaptive adversaries. <laughs> yeah, but the short answer is, yeah, you can actually get this to work against adaptive as well, adversaries as well. Okay. Uh, yeah. why, why can't your sub-linear algorithm also report an action? Oh, um, so there's a lower bound. Uh, I actually talk about the sublinear algorithm, and then it becomes crucial why it cannot find the map. How does it estimate the size without finding the matching? Um, OK. So back to sublinear algorithms. Before talking about the half approximate linear time algorithm, I'll first tell you a little bit about the history of the sublinear matching uh, problem. Um, so the, the study of sublinear algorithms for matchings uh, was started with this work of Parnas and Ron from 2007, um, who gave an algorithm that runs in uh, quasi-polynomial in the maximum degree time, delta to, delta to log delta time, and provides an almost half approximation. So this is sublinear so long as delta is sufficiently small. If it's, for example, constant or even slightly super constant, um, this runs in sublinear time the size of the graph. And over time, this dependency on delta was improved. Um, um, an important milestone uh, was achieved by Yoshida Yamamoto and Ito in stock 2009, who showed an algorithm running in poly delta time, uh, providing half approximation. And they also showed that you can also get one minus epsilon approximation delta to one over epsilon square time. Um, but the problem with these algorithms, these early algorithms, is that they may all uh, take n squared time if delta is not sufficiently small. So if delta is n, linear in n, all of these algorithms take n squared time. Um, so the more modern sublinear algorithms run in sublinear time, even if the maximum degree can be as large as n. Um, so the first such algorithm was um, introduced by uh, Michael uh, et al, um, who gave a large constant approximation in order n time. And this was improved over time. Um, yeah, so I'm not going to talk about all of these, but to summarize, uh, as I mentioned before, we have three algorithms now. Um, half approximation n time, slightly better than half approximation, and slightly larger than n time. And bomb minus epsilon approximation is slightly smaller than n squared. OK, so this is about the things we know, the algorithms we know. Um, so now I want to tell you about um, how the half approximate algorithm, how this, this first one works. Um, how we can obtain a half approximation of the size of the maximum matching in order n time, n polylog n time. OK. So the general idea, which is actually the same um, across all of these algorithms, 
um, is the following. So you suppose that you have some maximum, some, some matching M that is fixed by some oracle, okay. Um, and then the oracle, given any vertex, returns if it is matched in this matching M and uses only Q queries, okay. So this is some matching that's fixed somewhere. We do not have access to it directly, but there's some oracle. We can ask the oracle, is this vertex matched inside this matching or not? And the oracle spends Q time, makes Q queries, and responds whether the vertex is matched or not. Okay, so suppose that we have this oracle. Um, then the way we estimate the size of the matching is we take T vertices, sample T vertices at random, run the oracle on these T vertices, um, and this is the fraction of the vertices that are matched. We multiply it by N. This will be our estimate of the number of vertices that are matched in the whole graph. Right? So we basically assume that the samples that we take represent uh, the graph, the vertices of the graph well. We just look at their empirical average, multiply this by the number of vertices. This gives the number of vertices that are matched in the overall in, in the in the whole graph. We divide by two because we want to count the number of edges typically, not the vertices. Okay. Um, so this general idea requires two parameters to be set. One is Q, the time that the oracle takes to answer a query, and T, the number of samples. Uh, for now, assume that T is constant. In fact, if you're willing to pay an additive epsilon n error, um, you can set T to the one over epsilon squared. And, um, and even if um, you do not want to pay an additive epsilon n error, you want multiplicative approximation, so um, T would have to be slightly super constant, but it's still going to be small. Um, okay. So the main question really now, if T is a small, what is the value of Q? So what is the query complexity for answering whether a given vertex, which in fact will be a random vertex in this um, framework, um, is part of the matching or not? And this depends on our choice of matching M and how the oracle works. So this is this is how the different algorithms differ. Okay. So um, what I talk about now is the greedy oracle. So a, a greedy maximal matching is a simple algorithm. Yeah. Quick question: Are the bounds that you're going to get like with high probability on expectation? Um, that's a good question. So usually the way it works is you get an expectation and then you repeat a couple of them, take average, and that gives you the yeah, right bound yeah. with high probability. Okay, so okay, so now take the so now th I'm gonna fix that matching M um, that the oracle is gonna tell us if it is if a vertex is part of it or not. So what is this matching? So I will first draw um, some per suppose that we have some permutation over the edges of the graph. Yeah. If we have this permutation, then we can define a greedy maximal matching with respect to it as follows. We go over the edges one by one. Um, first, for example, we visit edge one. Uh, it doesn't have any endpoints matched, so we put it in the matching. We greedily, every time we see an edge, we put it in the matching if it is possible. So two would won't be added to the matching, three will be, and continues so on and so forth until we get this matching. So this is called the greedy maximal matching with respect to this given permutation. Um, and the output is always going to be a maximal matching, and it will result in a half approximation of the size. Uh, and any maximal matching is at least half the size of a maximal matching. It's so simple to prove. Um, so this is a good algorithm if you're fine with half approximations. But the question is, do we actually have an oracle that when asked about a vertex can provide whether the vertex is matched or not fast? Um, and the key to designing such oracle is this observation. That if an edge, that an edge E is in the matching, if and only if there is no other edge that has a lower rank incident to that edge that's in the matching. Right, so for example, this edge 12 is not in the matching because it has a lower rank neighbor 11 that is in the matching. Um, yeah, so every edge that's not in the matching, if you check, it must have another incident edge that has a lower rank and is inside the matching. Um, okay, and then if we, given this observation, uh, the idea for the oracle is as follows, and this was first suggested by Onak and Nguyen in 2008. 
Um, so suppose that we want to know if edge 11 is in the matching or not. So what they do is they recursively go over all of the edges incident to 11 and recursively ask if they're part of the matching or not. Um, and in doing so, um, it's better to start with the edge that has the smallest possible rank. Intuitively, if you draw this permutation at random, the edges that have lower ranks have higher probability of being part of the matching. So you want to find a match, an edge that's in the matching as quickly as possible and terminate the process. So you'll start with the lowest rank edge, neighboring 11, that would be 6. They recursively call this function on 6. 6 would query 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. At this point, 1 doesn't have any other edge incident to it that has a small rank, so we immediately get that 1 must be in the matching. We backtrack, um, 2 won't be in the matching, 3 will be in the matching because 2 is not in the matching and it doesn't have any other incident edge. So on and so forth until going back to 11. So 11 now realizes that 6 is not part of the matching, so it would now query the next edge 10. Um, and again, the same thing continues um, for 10. 10 would also query 9, would backtrack to 11, and at this point, we get that 11 must actually be in the match. Um, so this is actually an instance that shows this recursive query process could really be bad. You, you just explored the whole graph. But if we actually started querying for maybe edge 12, it would terminate much earlier. So 12 would first query 8. 8 would query 7. 7 is in the matching. 8 is not. And 12 would query 9, but 9 is in the matching, and we immediately terminate without going through this whole thing for 11, okay? So now the question is, um, what happens for a typical vertex and if you pick a random permutation? Just, just a quick question. Here we're querying edges as opposed to vertices, right? So it's a slightly different. Um, that's a good question. Yeah, so this is the recursive query process for edges. Okay. And for a vertex, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to call this edge oracle on all of its edges ah. in the increasing order of the rank. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, that's a very good question. So now let's define this quantity q, v, and pi to be the number of edges that we recursively query um, if we want to determine if a vertex v is matched in the greedy algorithm according to some permutation pi. Um, so Onaka Nuan, who introduced this recursive process, showed that for every vertex, so long as this permutation pi is random, the expected size of this recursive query tree is upper bounded by e to the delta, um, which is small when delta is constant. So they, they, their focus was on um, constant degree graphs. Um, and um, yeah, yeah, the intuition is to basically count the number of monotone paths coming out of a vertex. Um, so later on, um, a year later, uh, so they actually asked, is this tight or is, is there better analysis? And a year later, Yoshida, Yamamoto, and Ito showed that indeed the, the, this, is, uh, this can be much improved to polynomial in delta, more specifically delta times the average degree of the graph, um, which is upper bound by delta squared, um, with one additional assumption that this vertex v is also random. So the permutation is random, the vertex that we query is also random, but this assumption is not, um, Worrisome because even um, in our framework, anyway, we, we take a random vertex to run this oracle on it. Yeah. So the quick question: If we just want this to hold for any vertex, not a random vertex, is there a lower bound known which says that you can't get an order delta complexity? Um, I think there is a lower bound of delta squared. Um, and is this in the Yoshida paper? No, um, I think this is in the. Um, Soda 20 paper of Kapral of et al. So if you want this to hold for any given vertex, there, there's an instance where it's at least delta squared. There is no polynomial in delta upper bound for a given vertex. Yeah, yeah so if, if, you, if you wanna know what happens for a, for a given vertex that's not random, even poly delta is not known. That's a very nice question. Um, that's, that's been open for, for a long time. Okay, anyway, so, so what I proved was um, I tightened this. 
uh, up to the log n factor, I show that the same quantity for random vertex and random permutation, the size of this recursive query tree is upper bounded by the average degree times log n. And it's also lower bounded, lower bounded by average degree. So the, the right answer is somewhere between. Um, so up to log n factors of cells. That, um, and there's a little bit of work from going this to the uh, order n time algorithm. Um, because here, uh, so you want to, so you start from a vertex, you want to recursively only call it on the lowest rank edge, but you do not have all of the edges. So there's a little bit of implementation um, uh, details that I'm hiding, but basically this says for a random vertex, you can spend average degree time, know whether it's in the matching or not. Uh, and you just run it on a constant number of vertices. This is going to give you a half approximation with some additive epsilon n error. If you want to get rid of the additive epsilon n error, the number of samples would be roughly delta over average degree. Um, multiplied by this, this is going to be delta. Uh, so the algorithm really just takes delta time. Um, but, the but you have to first scan all the degrees, remove the degree zero vertices, and then it becomes delta. So it's really just n if, if the, there is a vertex. If, the, if we have the instance where the graph is either empty or one edge, that does really take n time. It's not always delta, but yeah, it's, it's always upper bounded by n anyway. So, so I'm saying that this implies with a little bit of implementation details to an algorithm that half approximates the size of the matching multiplicatively in order n time, n polylog n time. Okay. So yeah, so this is how the um, this is how the this is what the bound the final bound was. Um, I wanted to. Um, provide some insights about the analysis, how this is proved. Um, but I guess in the interest of time, I'll skip this. Um, the only thing that I want to mention is that um, the key really is we want to analyze the number of queries out of a vertex. This is the quantity Q that we want to bound. Um, and this is really hard to bound. Um, as I said, we do not even know a poly delta bound for a given edge. And the way to get around this is instead of counting the number of edges that this ed given edge queries, we count the number of vertices that actually query this edge. So, so we count it, we, we give a bound on the dual um, question, and that is enough um, to bound the query complexity, so long as the vertex is, a is an average vertex. It could be that a, a vertex queries a lot of vertices, um, um, but an average vertex, I mean, I'm not saying that there's a, there's a bound, but the, the, the proof leaves it possible that a vertex queries a lot of vertices, um, uh, but, but proves that for an average vertex, it doesn't query a lot of vertices. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here. I just wanna conclude with a number of questions. Um, yeah, so for the sublinear matching problem, these are the known algorithms. Um, I mentioned these three, half approximation, slightly better than half approximation, and bound minus epsilon approximation. There's also another algorithm specifically for low degree graphs. Uh, if, you're, if, they're, if, if you're, your, your um, uh, graph has maximum degree delta and think of delta as uh, not so large, maybe like delta is smaller than n to epsilon squared. Um, then Yoshida, Yamamoto, and Ito showed in SUC 2009 that you can obtain about minus epsilon approximation in delta to one over epsilon squared time. Uh, so this could potentially be better than this if the Degrees are sufficiently. Uh, okay, on the lower bound side, we talked about that any constant approximation requires omega n time. Um, any better than two thirds approximation requires n to 1.2 time. Um, and this is a new lower bound we showed um, a few months ago that any one minus epsilon approximation uh, requires delta to linear and one over epsilon number of queries. So basically, this comes very close to the algorithm of Yoshida. Uh, the difference is that this is delta to 1 over epsilon squared. This is delta to 1 over epsilon. Um, yeah, so that exponent, uh, um, yeah, the improving it of the algorithm with the lower bound is, is, in my opinion, a very interesting question if, if, if one can get a tight bound. Um, OK, so, so some open problems um, that I want to mention other than this. 
is can we get better than half approximation in n time? Uh, so yeah, so the best known approximation in order n time remains to be this half approximation that I just talked about via the greedy algorithm. Um, you can get better than half, but you'd have to pay an additional n to epsilon cost. Um, yeah, so obtaining better than half approximation in order n time would be extremely interesting. Um, or generally improving this this lower bound. Maybe like you can relax this assumption that you want a two thirds plus epsilon approximation. Maybe mm -hmm. to a smaller even be half plus epsilon approximation, and that would basically show that uh, the half approximation is the best uh, um, one can get. In other words, um, if we restrict the running time of the algorithm to be n poly log n, the answer is at least half approximation. The right approximation is at least half and at most two thirds. So the answer is somewhere in between. Um, that's an important question, in my opinion, to settle. Another question is, for this um, one minus epsilon approximation, um, the exponent, this epsilon prime exponent depends on epsilon. And if you want a really small, a really good one, maybe 0.99999 approximation, the running time is probably n to 1.999. Uh, so if you want to, um, so whether there is an algorithm running in n to 1.99 time, maybe has some ex maybe has some dependencies on epsilon still, uh, maybe like times uh, some f of epsilon, uh, and obtains a one minus epsilon approximation that would be extremely interesting. And generally, obtaining better lower bounds that tighten these these algorithms uh, would be an excellent question. Um, okay, with that, I'm going to conclude. Uh, would be happy to answer any questions. Thanks for the great talk. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Um, is there a question in the adjacency matrix? Um, yeah, you use you the microphone for the question. You mentioned adjacency matrix. What's the question there? Yeah, so the for the adjacency matrix uh, model, um, what is written, we only know that omega n time is needed for any constant approximation, even if the, first of all, like for adjacency matrix, if the matching is small, if the graph is either empty or one edge, you're gonna have to square the n squared. But suppose that the matching is linear in n, now the question is, what is the time complexity? So you can all, now ask all of these questions um, just with the extra assumption that the matching is linear in n at least. Um, and there, uh, this half approximate algorithm still works. You can still get a half approximation in order n time. The lower, the only lower bound, the, the lower bound, all, not this lower bound, but the, the lower bound that any constant approximation requires n time also holds. Um, but the super linear lower bounds um, in n, yeah, the, 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 what's written is that the, the, they only work in the adjacent to this model. I uh, believe should be possible with the same techniques as our, um, Stock 23 paper to get a superlinear and lower bound in the adjacency matrix as well. Um, yeah, but we have not written it yet. So, okay. Thanks for the talk. I just wanted to mention because I kind of zoned out earlier about the question about the lower bound. So I wanted to say that um, there is a stronger lower bound, conditional lower bound for uh, exact dynamic matching, even when you're trying to check if the graph has a perfect matching. So it's also in the size case um, where if up per update, you basically have to spend linear in n time, even in sparse graphs. So that means linear in M, essentially. So you really need to approximate to get, get these results unless something happens. One quick question. Um, so you showed that on average, uh, if you randomly sample vertex that, and other random permutation, then um, you like query a few edges. I'm wondering, uh, do anything about the variance of this process? Like, is this a very high variance process? Or um, is it like what type that's of? That's a good question. 
the proof doesn't give any bound on the variance other than Markov. Are there examples where like the variance can be very high? Of, you know? Um. So the the only example is the one I mentioned to Cheyenne that the, there there are graphs when um, for most vertices it's delta, but there's this one specific vertex that if you query it, it's going to be at least delta squared. Okay. Basically, okay. 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 okay.